A very good afternoon and thank you so much for having taken the time to join the webinar. My name is Jay Reddy. I'm a cybersecurity evangelist here at Manage Engine. Guys, today's webinar is around a very specific and a special topic, I'd say, on ransomwares and cyber threats at this very juncture in time. The webinar today is being recorded. For those of you who have questions coming up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to shoot your questions then and there. I try taking as many questions as possible during the webinar, just in case if I miss a question or two, do not worry. I'll have them answered towards the end of the webinar. Lovely. So that being said, let's quickly get started with today's webinar. So what I've done is I've kind of put together a simple five-step action plan. And this action plan is essentially inspired from the NIST recommendations that are out there. The NIST put together a cybersecurity framework, and I kind of took inspiration from that framework to put this five-step action plan, just in case if you're one of the organizations out there who is intending to secure your organization against ransomware and cyber threats. Now, through today's webinar, I'd be sharing a lot of experience, first-hand experience. In fact, if I were to point it out to you, I've been working remotely for almost about 150 days right now. Now, through the whole length of remote working. We've got almost about 8,000 folks in our entire organization who are scattered across the world, logging into our systems day in, day out, and accessing files and folders and whatnot. That's uh, my first-hand experience. And yes, in the process, we've also been able to help a lot of organizations around the world to uh, get all remote ready, right? That is the idea. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of first-hand information accounts of attacks that had happened as they had happened and give you insights into how to effectively defend uh, your organization against the new landscape that we're talking about. Now, as we go forward, one major observation that you just can't skip, uh, skip is the new normal that people keep talking about these days. Working from home, working remotely has become a very major part of how IT is going to be driven in the future. We are talking about enabling our workforce to work remotely. And with that said, it also brings in a ton of lot of vulnerabilities and risks associated with remote working that get into your organization as we speak. We're talking about enabling our users to log in into your corporate resources and access your corporate resources from their home Wi-Fi. How unsecure could that be? We're talking about not just enabling them to work from home, but also they're bringing their own devices to work in addition to bringing their own vulnerabilities along with them while they come to work. So a couple of factors that we'll be taking into account to define the threat landscape against which we are pitched against. Right. And here, the major challenge that we're talking about is the perimeter. Now, back in the day when it was about ransomware or any cyber threat for that matter, it was always the function of your strong network security, your pr protocols and your firewall rules and so on and so forth. In addition, with SIM solutions that were working in tandem with them to protect your organization from the outside. That was the case. Now, the perimeter or the so-called perimeter has kind of vanished in my point of view, or it's kind, kind of become very unclear. Why? Because all of your users are logging into your systems from different geographies around the world, right? Or it could even be within your country too, for that matter. But these users form the first line of defense for your organization. Why is that again? Because we are talking about a situation where a lot of us, for the first time, organizations that are conventional organizations that are continuous process industries that never really gave priority uh, to remote working or IT for that matter, have been forced to move in that direction. Attackers are very well aware of what's happening. And in fact, as we keep tuning into the news, we keep hearing about how attackers are becoming extremely sophisticated and smart in capitalizing this opportunity. They're trying to initiate very targeted attacks on critical stakeholders in your organization as they work from home. So can you trust your users is the billion dollar question right here. Because all these attacks are going to be centered around taking over your user's account. Now, be it a ransomware, be it another form of cybersecurity threat that we're talking about, all of them start with a business email compromise, most of the cases, or an account takeover for that matter. Now, we're talking about the security of your organization relying on the weakest link in this equation, which is your users. 
Now, these are the users who write their passwords on a piece of paper or sticky note and have it stuck right on top of their desktop while they were at work. How can we trust these users with these privileges that they keep requesting for? Most of the times, unfortunately, what's happening is, as I speak with a lot of security leaders, uh, there's this trend right now, not a very favorable one, I would say, a trend where most of these cybersecurity protocols that we're talking about are a little watered down for the benefit of better access, right? We want business continuity and usability for our users, and our protocols are a little watered down. In fact, regulations like HIPAA, for that matter, have been relaxed. Is that the right thing to do? Because we're talking about users presenting opportunities to the attackers out there, asking them to come attack them. Now, as we go forward, the cloud adoption has been immense. The whole hybrid identity access management is also taking speed. If you were to closely know and watch the market, almost about 600% increase in adoption of Office 365 and other relevant applications, collaboration applications like Microsoft Teams for that matter. Now, what do you do? Now, the attacker, all that they want is just one opportunity to get into your system. And we've presented 100 new opportunities for the attackers while working remotely. So all that the attacker wants is to look for that user who's vulnerable, who's prone to open emails that are malicious or that can be easily schemed and scammed. The users fall prey for such attacks and they get into your system. Now. In fact, Microsoft went on to make this announcement. I'm going to give you one minute to go through this simple infographic given out by Microsoft. So if you notice, it's quite obvious. It's not the problem of attacks. Uh, it's not the problem of accounts being taken over. It's not even the domain administrator account being compromised. The Concern right here, right now, is attacks are going undetected. Attackers are doing a great job figuring out how to get away with all the exfiltration that they're doing. And turns out the opportunity that they have right now, the situation that has presented itself to them, is also in their favor. Now, when it comes to tracking down data exfiltration, you'd have the best in class resources, no doubt. But when it comes to the situation right now, there's a lot of chaos already. Your users are logging in from various geographies, operating from different time zones, accessing various de de devices, resources, files, folders, all of them that have suddenly been moved to the cloud and your data is all over the place. This gives the attacker a great opportunity to hide in plain sight. And trust me, I've spoken to a lot of uh, CIOs and CTOs in the last couple of months, and the common observation is it's taking a long time to even detect that some sort of exfiltration is happening because all of this data gets camouflaged or lost in the whole back and forth uh, data transfer that's happening between all your users who are scattered across geography. So this is a terrible problem that we've got at this point in time. And yes, all of these breaches are taking more time than they used to take before. So containing these breaches, doing a risk assessment is where you'd start. But the risk right now is very dynamic. You wouldn't really be able to pinpoint. So my recommendation to you to start the webinar today is to assume that you are already under an attack as we speak. Now, I might sound paranoid, but then that is the uh, reality of the hard. We are talking about users who are falling prey for attacks that are COVID themed. Now, a lot of us have tried much to educate them, but turns out still the cons there's consistent increase in attacks that are COVID themed and users are falling prey for these attacks. We're talking about uh, critical stakeholders in the organization who fall prey for an attack that looks like this an email that's sent out from the World Health Organization. This is just a pretend email that looks like as if it's sent from the World Health Organization or CDC. People do click on these. These are the same users who click on an email that says do not open or download an attachment that do, do not says do not download. So these are the users who can get your organization at risk. Now, why would I say this? Now, if you were to think now, my users are operating and then they'd probably be using this from their personal device, there is the question right here. Now, these are the same devices with which they're accessing your network to right now as we speak. And in fact, it's very rampant, not just in a specific country, it's all across the world. In fact, here from where I'm presenting today, here in India, 
right? Almost about a month back, there was this major scam that went out. A lot of people fell victim before they could contain a lot of damage that already happened. One of the biggest financial institutions in the country was a victim of one of these social engineering phishing attacks. They pretended to be the government. They pretended to ask for some basic information around your account, your social security number and stuff like that. But they ended up giving and getting a lot of uh, data of users across that specific financial institution before they could contain a lot of damage had already gone down. Attackers are extremely smart. They understand the landscape really well. They are using the opportunity that has presented itself also very well. They can kind of engineer your users in not just giving away credentials, but also sharing intellectual property, probably even all of this happening over your corporate email account. So what do you do? So I've put together a very simple strategy right here. Like I pointed out earlier, it's going to be a five pronged approach. We'll start with identification. We'll figure out where are your weak spots. We'll assess risk firstly, before we try to counter a ransomware or before we try to counter a cybersecurity attack. We'll identify where your weak spots lie. That's the first and foremost requirement when you're going forward having a mitigation strategy in place, having a disaster recovery strategy in place. You then go forward and detect what are these deviations that we keep hearing about. Now, your users obviously are going to not work the same way how they used to work while they were at office. Things are going to be a little different. That is a given. But how can you kind of not fall prey into an endless loop of false positives. So we'll understand that aspect also to detect activity patterns that deviate from usual behavior. We'll go a little further to understand and assess your existing security portion. Now we're talking about taking into consideration logs from multiple sources, correlating all of them and getting hold of data that could give you one quick snapshot of where you are right now. Now the greatest challenge when it comes to these attacks is doing a root cause analysis. Now, trust me, that's going to be a very difficult thing at this very point in time because data is all over the place. You have a hundred new touch points in your system. It's not just your network security that you need to be worried about. In fact, it goes on to the extent where you need to start worrying about your endpoint security for your users and their personal devices. Now, users are getting away with making copies of business data on their personal desktops, on their personal uh, devices. Now that has become a normal thing while working remotely. Now we've been a little okay with that for the fact that it keeps business going, but turns out attackers want to take advantage of the situation. So right here is a very simple model from NIST, right? They've given us a very clear pattern and a flow diagram to tell you where you want to go and how you want to uh, at attack the whole situation right here. We're talking about, being prepared for the whole assessment starts right there and then conducting an assessment by taking into account what all could likely go wrong, getting the right stakeholders informed in the process, maintaining the assessment. And I'd follow that up with one thing, which is uh, recovery also, which is a very important strategy that can probably be added to it. So throughout the course of the webinar, I'm going to be giving you what are the challenges and how to encounter them and tackle them head on. That is the idea right here. And in the process, yes, we'd also want to build a very clear portfolio of who's going to do what, what are we going to be tracking and how exactly are these security strategies going to operate in our favor? So I'd want to start with the first takeaway for the day, which is identifying risks in your network. Now, when we want to track or counter any of these attacks, the first thing to do is to have a clear cut mechanism that tells you where are these deviations. Now, when you look for such deviations, you'd not be able to really find them in plain sight. They'd be out there, but unless you're able to correlate these activities as they happen, get context and build a story around it, it's going to be very difficult to do a root cause analysis. To start with, the simplest of all would be to track logon behavior. So through the course of the webinar, I'll be talking a lot about why is logon activity monitoring and tracking important. When it comes to logon activity as a telltale sign, you'd be able to instantly spot that there's an attacker out there trying to infiltrate into your system if there are repetitive logon failures. And if they happen at a very short span in time, let's say in under a minute, 100 logon failures occur. That could mean nothing but a brute force attack, right? 
Followed by that, there's one successful logon, and then there's an installation of a program. It could potentially be a malware, you'd never know. And then there's exfiltration of data being sent back and forth. Now on a given day, while working remotely, it's going to be difficult because a lot of users are forgetful. Logon failures are a normal event. Successful logons are a normal event. Installation of applications are a normal event. Data being sent back and forth are, is a normal event. Now, unless you're able to correlate all of this, you would be blindsided. So that is the whole idea right here. So you will need to be starting to look at what you already have in place. You've got the event viewer, you've got the event log analysis that is going on. We understand that finding out these events in the event viewer will be as similar as finding a needle in the haystack and hence you'd need a provision to correlate all of this into a single story. So is the case with modifications that happen to privileged accounts. Now, most of the cases, almost in all cases, I'd say, cybersecurity criminals target the accounts with the keys to the kingdom. And these are the accounts that have the privileges. These are the accounts that can open up a lot of doors for them in terms of the access to data, in terms of access to resources, in terms of the reach Everything is uh, always about targets uh, targeting towards these accounts that have privileges. Now, when we're talking about keeping a track of these privileged accounts, it goes without chain. Uh, it go goes without saying that you'd want to do a lot more in this specific area. We're talking about privileged access management and privileged users monitoring. And in this process, there are a couple of easy giveaways when it comes to attackers trying to infiltrate. Usually you'd see sudden spike in activity from a privileged account. Usually you'd end up seeing a first time access done with a specific privilege. You'd see modifications that are done to group policy objects in easy way. If they want to disrupt your business, this is exactly what they'd be doing. So being able to have a system that can tell you what's happening when something's deviating from usual behavior, you'd need to have that for activities on privileged groups and privileged users. Another classic case is dormant accounts, especially if these accounts are administrator accounts or ones with the privileges. Trust me, my first recommendation would always be to clear out any inactive dormant account in your organization. But for the want of some organization requirement, if you have them archived, if you have them dormant in your system still existing, please do at least this. Have them restructured, have them renamed, make it difficult for the attacker to even identify that these are the accounts with those privileges because we're not just talking about attackers from outside. It could very well be users inside your organizations who could go rogue and users inside your organization have privileged information to find out who are these administrator accounts that are dominant and they can take advantage of that. So make it absolutely impossible for both an insider and an outsider, only the people who need to know are the ones who are supposed to know what exactly these accounts are named after. Along those lines, an easy tip would be to honeypot your attacker. This is my favorite way of catching hold of attackers. In fact, you'd find out that a lot of users in your organization, just for the heck of it, want to give a shot at the administrator account. A lot of them do that all the time. And trust me, there are chances that it need not be even intentional. It can just be accidental and your users might end up opening a lot of doors for the attackers. So cleaning up your systems for inactive accounts is my recommendation always when it comes to foolproofing your strategy. In case if you still want to have these accounts, please have them renamed and make them almost impossible to find with the basic tricks that these attackers have. Their playbooks shouldn't be working right here. Instead, you can set a trap for them with a honeypot, a pretend account that looks like the admin account, but then one that is under constant monitoring for access. If anybody is initiating an access to that account, you would obviously know it's not the people with the information. It's not someone who's supposed to be accessing and you'd be able to call it out immediately. That's a quick tip for you. And yes, goes without saying, in almost all of these attacks, be it a ransomware or another cybersecurity attack, it is always about data. Bottom line, it's about data. Because now when it comes to monitoring activity over data, now you have a very new challenge altogether. Your data is all over the place on your users' endpoints. It's on your corporate servers. It's on your uh, cloud. You do not really know where to start. So being able to detect at least unusual activities in terms of volume, let's say unusual volume of files being modified, files being modification, obviously that's a ransomware. The moment you know that it exceeds the threshold, files are being renamed or files are being extensions being changed for the files, you would know that something's going wrong. You need to be notified right away. So that is a very easy giveaway right there. Now, along those lines, it is not just 
encryption of those files for a ransom but also at times these attackers would have a very clear agenda to just disrupt your business and delete these files so both on cloud and on prem you will need to have systems that track and identify such unusual activity and yes a uh, first line of defense along with passwords is always account lockouts and account lockouts can very clearly go away if there's a password spray attack or a brute force attack and innumerable number, number of accounts being locked out from a single source a single source account lockout is always a great indicator of compromise so i will want to start today's webinar with just the identification side of things where you know where to look for even before you start preparing yourself for an attack right because an attack is if not today some day it is going to be uh, the case and we'll want to be sure about our risk assessment now when it comes to how do you prioritize how do you calculate there are two angles to it one is the quantitative angle and the other one is the qualitative angle a lot of times when we put together a risk assessment strategy for a cyber security attack or your risk posture it turns out we are very comfortable about a qualitative approach where we say this is important than the other but my recommendation would be a quantitative approach get the stakeholders on on board to figure out what assets in your organization are how important and what's the numerical or dollar value that is associated with these devices and data that we're talking about now when you nail that it's going to be difficult to do that but when you do that you would know what to prioritize because when it comes to cyber security attacks the attackers go for <clears throat> the jackpot always they do a reconnaissance they take enough time to find out what's most valuable for you and that's exactly where they'd focus it could be intellectual property it could be patents it could be corporate information that is pertaining to your business it could be company secrets anything for that matter but you would know only if you get the right stakeholders on board to get them to prioritize both qualitatively and quantitatively it might be a little difficult but please do look at it from that standpoint because we'd want to know and monitor a lot of aspects such as when where how why all of it of uh variables in your equation of security we're talking about workstations being monitored we're talking about domain controllers databases through and through anything and everything that is connected to your network you will need to be in the know so be able to do risk assessments both quantitatively and qualitatively because identifying where your targets lie you'll have to be ahead of the attacker and that is my recommendation so for that a simple thing to do would be to set and build dashboards so at any given point in time you would know which are the accounts that could be potential targets top accounts the most risky ones the ones with the most accesses the ones making the most modifications probably other giveaways also the ones that are being accessed the most and locked out changes continuously happening failed activity on these accounts top modified servers ones that are critical files and folders that are important that hold potential intellectual property all of that at any given point in time you wouldn't want to run reports you wouldn't want to go through or skim through tons and tons of logs but you'd want out of the box dashboards that give you numbers that speak business that is the idea right here and all of our management also wants the same thing so being able to identify where to start your security strategy is a very critical component of your risk assessment against a cybersecurity threat like a ransomware or any other for that matter so be in the know i've given you a couple of pointers as to where to look for let's go a little further and talk about how do you detect such a uh, devious behavior now when it comes to anomalous activity the challenge right here is to use context in your advantage now it's going to be absolutely difficult if you just set threshold values or blanket values for all of these attacks you'd end up getting a tons of false positive in that process it's not just about the overload that we're talking about in addressing these false positives but also the fact that a real threat can be missed out in the process so being able to keep track of anomalous activities especially malicious behavior being able to track such activity on filed and folder accesses permissions that are being modified and being able to put all the story together to track all data pertaining to remote activity like the log on log of data like startup and shutdown times like at a given point in time who are the users who are tethered to your network if there are vpn connections that are is going that are going on can you uh, tell me that you have reports and monitoring that is set up to get, give you a list of all your users who are connected via a vpn so you would need such information when you want to detect activity patterns i'll start with a very simple thing which is the log on activity like i told you i'd be touching upon quite a few times 
through today's presentation, an easy direction to look for. Now, a brute force attack is a repetitive logon failure followed by a successful logon. That's a quick giveaway. So is the case with island hopping. Attackers tend to do this. They want as much as ground to cover. They want as much as foothold to get hold of. And that being said, they do not stop with just that one initial compromise. They'd want to take your entire network down and they're going to do everything within their power to get hold of as many number of accounts as possible in the process. And if you were to get an insight on where is this logon happening from and how is this not usual, you'd be able to quickly call out a lethal moment. How? Because a lethal moment usually starts with an initial foothold. It's basically through a phishing attack. Now, once that account is compromised, you'd trust me, you'd be surprised as to what all an attacker can do with just a normal user account. No privileges required, just a normal user account that's a part of the domain users group in your Active Directory. They'd be able to get tons of information with just basic LDAP scripts. A lot of PII, trust me, PII is readily available, personally identifiable information of your employees, their data, their names, their usernames, Corporate information is readily available with just basic LDAP queries on Active Directory objects. Now, that being said, they do that reconnaissance. They figure out who are the other accounts they'd want to target. They get hold of them. They crack through them. They use their privileges. They get hold of more accounts until they reach the domain admin account. And when they reach the domain admin account, your entire security is down. Now, when it comes to lateral movement, like I told you, it becomes impossible to detect unless you have a clear user behavior analytics platform in place. Why? Because there's an unusual activity on different hosts and the source of all these accesses are from a single IP address. So that's a clear giveaway or an indicator of compromise. So likewise, you can use your user behavior analytics in your favor. What is the trick right here? Now you can put machine learning to use right here, draw baselines for every user in your organization and not rely on blanket values or threshold values. Now, while working remotely, it is a given that every user behaves differently. Now, back in the day, it was just maybe from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. that were the working hours. Now, users tend to stretch back and forth and it's going to be difficult for you to exactly predict what's going to be the behavior. So doing user by user, user behavior analytics is the best way. How do they interact and engage and how have they done that in the last couple of months while they have been working remotely? That is going to give you an insight on what's their usual access volume. What is the velocity with which they are accessing? What is the time of the day from where they are accessing? Which geographical location? What's the network reputation? What are the devices that are already tethered and mapped under the name of the user? You can use context for every user to your advantage. If there are new accesses done, if there are new found privileges that are used, if there are applications that are installed or files that are accessed. So unusual logon activity can be a great giveaway in terms of lethal movement or a ransomware attack because there's going to be a spread a sudden one and you'd be able to pinpoint and say this user usually logs in from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and all of a sudden there's a login and that's at 5 a.m. and there's a malicious activity that follows that which is an installation of a file. They tend to laterally move after that, get hold of more uh, applications and more uh, servers and accesses to as many number of resources as possible and all of that initiated from this one devious IP address. You'd also be able to thwart an installation because you'd know that that account that that specific account had never really used uh, his or her privilege to make an installation and that too on a critical file or a folder or a file server, right? Such insights that are contextual to tell you why is it a deviation is definitely going to do you good in terms of getting on top of the situation and mitigating an attack that is underway. In most of the cases, the problem is even before your systems can alert you or set you a trigger warning, enough damage is done. So if you're able to be a step ahead of them by analyzing devious behavior, towards the end of the webinar, I'll give you one trick that can potentially stop any such account takeovers or identity compromises that happen in your organization. So in the process, you'd also want to establish that for most of these cybersecurity attacks, it is always about the privileged accounts being targeted and what happens later. Now here you have a very clear notification that says there's an unusual volume of user management activity. Now these users are being added to critical groups and that isn't a usual activity. While the normal behavior or the average for that user initiating the change, that privileged user initiating the change was zero. All of a sudden there's 
10 plus activities from that user. Now that is something that you need to be definitely worried about. So your systems need to be trained to track and call out such patterns or deviations in user behavior. So that is the second tip for the day, which is being able to detect and analyze deviation in behavior from both insiders. And if it's an attack, you'd be able to call that out right away because the patterns, the risk scores, the thresholds that were set for the user based on their normal baseline did not comply. And that obviously means that it is an attacker from outside. Next tip that I have for you is a very straightforward one, a must do in my opinion, being able to audit all critical Active Directory events. I'm assuming most of us who are joining today are still Active Directory organizations and it is important. Maybe if you have your own system, let's say you're an Azure or you're using Office 365, you would have your own parallels to whatever I'm going to be talking about. Now I've got five different categories of events listed right here. So five different categories of events that are listed right here. We're starting with log on activity 4624 and 4625 get the job done in almost all the cases. So you'd be able to quickly call out and trust me, if you haven't set up auditing for your systems, please do turn them on right away for at least these five categories. I've got an extensive list of 25 active directory event IDs that you should be monitoring, setting up auditing for and setting alerts if possible for while you're working remotely. So please do remind me at the end of the webinar, I'll give you my email address. You can write to me and I'll share you the entire list of 25 event IDs. It's a comprehensive list. You wouldn't want to look further, but if you're working remotely, you'd want them definitely audited. Uh, the five top ones that I thought you'd really want like do it right away would be group membership changes. We spoke about privilege creep and privilege escalation. So if you get hold of these three event IDs trapped 4728, 4732, you'd be on top of the situation. So is the case with account lockouts. Now account lockouts are a great indicator of compromise. There are two angles to account lockout. One is the logistics angle where there are forgetful users who lock themselves out in the natural course of business. There are others where, which are potential cybersecurity attacks. And when these account lockouts happen across accounts, you would definitely know something is wrong and you'd be notified because you had set thresholds. And so is the case with object and file access. Now this is going to be a little longer than everything else, because now we're talking about a situation where your files and folders are all over the place, both on-prem and on the cloud. If you recently moved to, let's say OneDrive, you would need systems to track activities on these critical files and folders. File integrity monitoring done, right? Who's got the access? Who's attempting to do that access? Is that a first time access? Or are these users trying to exfiltrate data to a hard disk or a hard drive? Back in the day, while at work, it would have been an impossible event for someone to carry a thumb drive or a physical uh, hard disk and get it plugged to your system and copy data. A lot of companies to date have such strict policies on no thumb drive policies, right? But now when your data is on the cloud, especially on OneDrive and other platforms, it's going to be easy unless you have a cloud access security broker in your uh, system to check, monitor if your users are making uh, uh, desktop copies or copying those devices, copying those data over to thumb drive. So you would need a clear cut policy and an auditing mechanism to track changes that are done to these files, folders and objects all through your network. An important one when it comes to uh, mitigating your cybersecurity risks. And the last one right here is a very uh, common one that most of the attackers do. They tend to clear out any trail that is already available. As such, it is very difficult right now as we speak to track these activities and attackers are trying to get away with whatever they're doing. And if they were to clear out their audit logs, whatever ones that were tracked based on the breadcrumbs that they leave, it's going to be very difficult. So that aspect of it is also covered. So do track events and get notified when someone's attempting to clear event logs. Along those lines, my recommendation to you would be your existing systems, be it Active Directory or Office 365, they have their own limitations in terms of how long can they archive your audit logs or how frequently do you back up your audit logs. But trust me, in case of a cybersecurity attack or a breach of a compliance regulation, it could be CCPA or GDPR or any of these compliance regulations that you keep hearing about. The one thing that could save your day is having a clear cut audit trail, every activity done right for at least a year long span. So look for solutions that can get you there. Log monitoring and auditing a very important aspect and having that archived is even more important. So for you to be able to assess what had gone wrong to do a root cause analysis or an assessment, you would need these critical event IDs along with the other 20 that I have for you 
to get on top of a system and be sure that in case of a cybersecurity attack, you'd be able to avert that. Now, you'll also need to take into account that there are other chances when you try to do risk assessment. It could be a human error where they open gates for an attacker to creep in. Some of the other mistake right here, cyber attacks that are obviously in the rise. And yes, hardware failure too. Just a couple of things that you need to have in mind when you're putting together a risk strategy for your organization. Now, I have very specific pointers right here. Ones around which ones should you be monitoring and how do you go about monitoring? So if you want to spot a rogue access, you'd be able to do that from deviations. Now, most of these insiders may be amateur ones who are trying to do some sort of rogue activity or exfiltrate data. They do it at non-business hours and you'd get very clear cut pictures as to their entire track from where they started, where did they go? What did they do? The whole deal is available right here. And at the same time, the logic is not to deal user activity in silos. Now, these are the same users who travel across different target systems, like an on-premise system, a cloud system, an application, a server, and do such malicious activities. So being able to correlate from all these different target systems, Active Directory, Azure, Office 365, activity on collaboration applications will be a game changer when you're trying to figure out how was this access rogue or otherwise. We were speaking about privileged users and privileged access management and monitoring such activities on privileged accounts. You've got an extensive out of the box reports that help you get there. Which ones were recently modified? Which ones were recently added? Was there a new group commission? Were there modifications made to group policy objects? All of such data right here, out of the box reports that tell you who was the member who got added to the security group? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? And how is this a deviation? Such results can help you in terms of preventing a potential leak or preventing a potential account takeover, right? Here, we also have other reports that get you to that very same direction, data security. From that standpoint, you'd have out of the box reports on who copy pastes stuff, who's got read accesses and files and what are they doing with that access? Have you been auditing changes that were done to SACLs? Who is the owner of that file? Have there been any failed attempts to read files? That is again, a great giveaway. Such out of the box reports can get you not just secure, but also compliant in it to a lot of regulations. NIST also recommends the same thing for you to be able to audit, track, monitor, report and alert right on time about these changes. We were talking about account lockouts and if you can pinpoint as to why that account got locked out and what's the history behind that account lockout, you need an analyzer that tells whether was it a bad credential, whether was it an expired account or a stale account on one of your uh, poor network drive mappings or was it a legitimate user forgetting their passwords or was it a cybersecurity attack? So you would need to know the cost because most of the times, trust me, in the lockdown while working remotely, the biggest challenge for administrators is answering calls for password resets and account unlocks. And if you can have that striked out of your system, you can focus more on cybersecurity rather than the logistics that is associated. So the last bit of it is going to be around protection. We saw how to respond to these attacks. Now we're going to be talking about protecting. What do you do? We spoke about account lockouts, right? From a security standpoint, you'd want to be on top of the system to figure out why did that initiate, do a root cause analysis. If it's a logistical issue, you can have that resolved for once. And if it's a long-term issue, you'd need to know what to do. And especially if it's a security issue, you'd need to get notified right away and curtail the impact of that cybersecurity attack and contain it and triangulate it to a very specific spot, cut out the user if possible with an automated incident response system. So you would be able to take a lot of decisions if you were to analyze the account lockout reasons. So is the case with our existing first line of defense. In most of the cases, in most of these cybersecurity attacks, the major problem is always passwords as the first line of defense. Now, a lot of us are looking at a future where passwords are going to be extinct, but turns out the reality is it's going to be a little difficult or more difficult than we thought uh, of taking passwords out of the system. They are here to stay for at least another five years, no doubt about that. So that being said, what do you do? Active Directory password policies are almost about two decades old, and there hasn't been a considerable improvement to the password policies. Now, attackers are very aware of these policies. Users still get away setting passwords like password at 123. I love you at 123. These were the most common used passwords in 2019. 
in 2018, in 2017, and three years before that too, because they have not changed ever. And if you were to continue using the same policies, that is going to be the case. And this is the first line of defense against any cyber security threat. So look for solutions that can strengthen your password policies, that can sit on top of your existing identity uh, policies and help you stop users from using any dictionary words. A very easy thing to do. A dictionary attack is what an attacker would start with. And if you can reverse engineer that against them, that definitely works in your favor. So stop your users from setting any passwords that have dictionary words in them. And keyboard waltzing, that's a thing. A lot of users do one, two, three, four, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, and they use predictable patterns. We did a research and turns out that there are only 450 different patterns based on which users set. Now that was a striking revelation for me. Now how predictable humans are, that's the whole deal. We might think we've got the best syntax for our password in mind for a strong password, but that doesn't turn out to be the situation. One way or the other, you fall in one of those categories if you were to use a pattern and it becomes easy. And there's this whole deal with password fatigue that is setting in, which is making users use incremental passwords. Now, when you provision new identities and enable them for collaboration, it goes without saying there are new passwords that are associated with it. There are new password policies, expiry that are associated with it, the whole length of identity password management that is there. So that makes them fatigued to the idea of resetting their passwords. In fact, NIST recommends a lot of organizations, uh, federal organizations, if I were to name a few, have also gotten rid of password expiry as a thing because we'd want to reduce the number of times where your users actually engage with a logon screen. Now, lesser the better, if possible, do contextual authentication, which we'd be talking about uh, in a while, and that would get the number of potential uh, social engineering attacks down. A lot of them fall prey for these phishing attacks, right? They give out their credentials on uh, platforms that pretend to be legitimate, getting your organization credential and security compromise. So reduce the number of times that your users need to ideally enter their passwords anywhere at all. Along those lines, if you can implement single sign-on, I talk about that in a bit, that could save some trouble. So here we're talking about stopping users from falling prey for password fatigue. And what you could do is ideally get them not to set passwords from, or let them not set passwords that have letters from previous passwords. So very simple and straightforward. My favorite one is always going to be password phrases or pass phrases as we call it. The longer, the more difficult to crack, the entropy of the password keeps going up. So please do look for solutions that do the job. And on top of it, and on top of all these policies, no matter how strong the password, if it's already been compromised, it is going to be a security threat, right? So what we did was we put together an integration with Have I Been Pond. Now these guys do a fantastic job in going all over the web to identify which accounts were compromised. If your users' accounts were compromised in one of those past data breaches and their credentials are available on the web, that gets back right here. And they have a solid repository that gets updated very frequently <clears throat> and regularly to ensure that your users do not have one of those passwords that have already been compromised. A very easy way to foolproof. So ones that have been already compromised, no matter how strong they are, they aren't any good. So those passwords can also be effectively stopped from your users being, uh, you know, setting them. So we've got an entire list of policies right here. The existing policies or the defense mechanism that your native systems provide aren't good enough. That is the bottom line. And to secure that against cybersecurity attack, you'd need a password policy strengthener to foolproof the whole idea of password security. A great device that all of us have is multi-factor authentication. Now, when it comes to implementing multi-factor authentication, it isn't rocket science. We would want the minimum friction possible for our users if you're just setting, to, setting out to implement MFA. So look for solutions and options that can easily integrate into their day-to-day -day life. An easy example would be a touch ID or a face ID. I am not a big fan of text notifications being sent or OTPs being sent over text messages, not a big fan, at least email verifications. Okay, but easier would be to look for possession factors rather than knowledge factors because people tend to write them down, right? So that is something that we do not want to happen. A simple case where hypothetically, let's say an administrator credential got stolen. The attacker tries to go forward thinking that he or she is going to have a field day, but then turns out there's this wall that they hit. 
there's a verification code that they need to validate before they can go forward with that very specific access. So now this is a game changer while working remotely. Most of these attacks right after a business email compromise or an account takeover, they get into your system, initiate a ransomware, initiate an installation of a malware and get away. But with that first line of defense done right, multi-factor authentication right at the time of the logon on it on your Windows or on your Linux or on your Mac, if you can get this, nail this right, they'd not be able to proceed further without that second factor right here. And in fact, while remote working, a lot of us tend to share our credentials, especially service account credentials being shared across your organization. And most of the times they get forgotten that they were shared. But if, if you had a second factor, it makes it all the more easy, right? Even better would be adaptive or contextual authentication, which in my opinion is the future of authentication. Now we're talking about being able to completely get rid of passwords. That's the ultimate future. But for now, we want to coexist with passwords. Now, how can we make the whole authentication process both effortless, smooth and ultra secure? That is the question right here. So we were talking about user behavior analytics a while back halfway through the presentation. Can we use the same logic right here? Now we already have data on the users. Uh, what do they do? Where do they access from? Which geography? What are the usual biometrics? Which device? What's their network range? Such information is already available and a risk profile gets drawn for every such user. So when they try to access if there are deviations from that risk profile, that is when the authentication is going to be firmed up. There are going to be more challenges for the user to go through to authenticate or approve to the system that they are who they claim to be. It makes a sea of difference and makes the whole process effortless and smooth. And in this way, if you nail our contextual authentication right, there'd be a future where you wouldn't re really need passwords. Context can get the job done for you multiple factors. We've got about 13 different factors worked into the solution right now, and they can get you going. And if there are any deviations, if essentially, if it's an attacker who's pretending, it's going to be impossible for Jay to travel from India to Nigeria in less than 30 minutes. That's impossible travel or superhuman travel. If the access is from a different geography and that span, because I have my UBA working in the background and it's already profiled me, it knows what exactly will Jay do? Where will he access from? Which endpoint? What time of the day? What files and folders does he is he requesting access for? All such data gets taken into account and policies can be configured to kick out a user to notify the administrator to block such an access right away then and there and blacklist. So that is the beauty or the future as we see with respect to adaptive authentication. So for a lot of cybersecurity attacks, this can be your redemption. Having a strong MFA, if you haven't implemented that already, there are a lot of free solutions out there. Microsoft Mobile Authenticator can get the job done if you're an Azure or Office 365. Multiple options available. Look for solutions that are flexible. If you want to go one step further, maybe try using adaptive or contextual authentication too. So along those lines, what we've done so far is we've tried to cover the ground on protecting or preventing against an attack. What if the attack had happened, the ransomware has been, uh, the payload has been released in your organization, what do you do? You need a foolproofing right there. What if you had all the critical data, we call it machine critical data, right? Machine critical data that could get your business back on track ASAP. So your recovery time object and your recovery point objective, both of them have to be absolutely clear and well-written. You would need to ensure that you can get back on track and be as resilient as possible when it comes to one of these attacks. Now, uh, the three to one backup rule does magic. Three copies of data stored at least in two different uh, formats uh, and the one being stored in a different geographical location or offsite or on the cloud. If all else fails, you'd have at least one of the three to help you get back on track. So three copies made for your critical data, two of them that are stored in different drive formats and one of them stored in a different geography. We call it the three to one rule of backup works like magic in almost all these cases. A lot of organizations have been benefited because they had a backup and being able to prioritize and test this is again a very critical thing that you need to do. So when you're putting, a, putting together a disaster recovery plan, most of the time, it so happens that it's a one-time thing. Unless a disaster really occurs, organizations do not revisit their disaster recovery plan, and that isn't a great thing to do. So do revisit 
try doing mock runs, figure out where do you slack, get the right stakeholders informed. And if you're probably looking outward for, let's say, a disaster recovery as a service, you've got a vendor who does that for you, set clear service level agreements, because all that we want is immediate action. We just can't wait. Every second without action can prove to be disastrous for the organization. So test and retest your disaster recovery plan. That would include risk assessment, finding out where your vulnerabilities reside, what are are the critical accounts in your organization, who is going to respond, how are you planning to back up your and recover your data, how do you prioritize data one over the other, a long list of things. And I have a template for disaster recovery in case if someone would be interested in a disaster recovery framework, I could send you that. It's a simple checklist of things to do. You can fill that out and see where you stand, right? We are in fact in the process of building a platform where you can enter your variables and see what sort of uh, Disaster recovery plans, can you export? We're working on that as we speak. So is the case with orchestrating the whole response mechanism. So you can't really wait for someone to step in, fly in, and then get the disaster recovery kickstarted. The right stakeholders need to be communicated. If it's a human error too, you'd need to be getting it back on track ASAP. If it's a ransomware, even better, you should have an automated incident response system in your place. Why is this that important? Now we're talking about being able to be on top of the situation, right? If you had an automated incident response system can, that can do the job for you, that can very clearly say, these are the list of workflows that we are going to be initiating in case of these formats of attack. That is the way forward with respect to how you do it. So with respect to pre-built timelines and rapid investigations, you'd need to know how long are you going to take to investigate an attack and get on top of the situation or exfiltrate when data is being exfiltrated, what do you do to curtail that? That's an important thing right there. Security analytics on investigation cycles, again, is something that you need to look into. So is the case with integrations with ITSM solutions. Now we'd want to be able to create quick tickets to know if what is going on is wrong, let the right stakeholders know, get them all informed. If something, it, it could be something as simple as notifying your users to reset their passwords and that being worked into your ITSM solution, you'd never know. Cases are innumerable. So being able to reduce the time of qualification, we call it the TTQ, when it comes to an attack is all that matters right here. So you'd need out of the box reports, no doubt about it, fast forensic analysis, uh, you'd need all your data right now. Now, this is where your archival go is going to come into the picture. We were talking about archiving your log data. If you want an automated incident response, all that data is going to be taken into reference when you do it. So is the case with behavioral analytics. We spoke about user behavior analytics. So being able to kick out that wrong user is again a great deal of effort right here. So when you're putting together this orchestration for your IT security uh, <clears throat> services management systems, you need to have out of the box integrations, let's say with a Jira so that you can raise a ticket right when it's detected. So through and through you have innumerable examples that all point towards automating the whole security response, being able to kick out that user or knowing who the user is in the first place, containing that attack before it could spread and become any bigger. So that is the last recommendation that I have for you for today. We've been discussing about quite a few problem statements. And what I've done is I've kind of figured that we'll need a framework to work it out still further. A very simple uh, summing up of this is going to be identification, protection, detection, and response and recovery. And NIST also works in tandem with my recommendation today. And this is one important slide that I'd want to conclude today's presentation with. You've got all of that right here. What do you do in case of an attack, in case of a risk assessment? These are the things that you will need to be doing, starting with being proactive with risk assessments, being in the know with respect to your identity governance, figuring out what is going to be your strategy, who are the stakeholders, letting your users know and becoming, making them ready for this is also very, very important. Cyber train them, let them know what links they need to click, which ones they shouldn't. Having a clear cut data security strategy, being able to detect anomalies as they occur, having a clear cut response mechanism in place, being able to analyze the data that you have just so that you can have a mitigation strategy in place. And yes, goes without saying, having a clear cut response system and recovery planning sums it up. So identification, protection, detection, response and recovery is the NIST cybersecurity framework too. 
So we've kind of covered quite some ground with respect to what are the attacks that you'd essentially be facing. We understand that the native tools fall short. If you were to just work with the event viewer, it would take ages for you to pinpoint where things have gone wrong. So we are here to help you out in case if you need any recommendations or if you want us to consult, we'd be more than happy. I'd be more than happy to understand what challenges are you facing and if you're looking for anything. We, I was talking about a couple of resources through today's session. The 25 list of event IDs was one thing. The cybersecurity framework is another thing. If you're looking at risk assessment, if you want a strategy for that, we'd be more than happy to share the framework. A lot of resources we've been putting together in the last couple of months, we've been helping organizations go remote and help Hence, all the information today. So most of that that I share today is based on my first hand interactions with security leaders. And we've been able to get quite some good traction and help organizations. That's exactly what I want to do for you as well. Do write to me. My email ID is right here on screen. jreddy at managingen.com. If you have questions, I'm going to take them on the chat right now. You've been a lovely audience. I hope I've uh, given you some bit of information or a kickstart for your cybersecurity plan. Just in case, if you want to have any questions, reach out to me. All right. You all have a great rest of the day, a great rest of the week too. Do stay safe. <clears throat> the next time when we meet, I hope we meet under better circumstances. Guys, you all stay safe. Take care. Wish you good luck.